So I've been around neutron scattering for a long time. Um, these days, I do tend to work more on new sources and concepts and instrument methods and technologies, but I still get to do some experiments occasionally, and usually when I do, it's studying um, molecular motion using quasi-elastic neutron scattering, which is my favorite neutron scattering technique, okay? So I'm going to tell you about it. I'm passionate about it. I really enjoy it. And um, if you have questions, please stick your hand up or interrupt me as we go. Don't wait till the end because this should be a little bit more interactive than that, all right? And um, let's get started because Brian says I have to finish on time. Unlike your last uh, speaker, <laughs> just, just to be clear. All right, uh, so an outline. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about incoherent neutron scattering. Just to remind you, I know you heard about this in Roger's talk. Uh, earlier in the week, uh, last week, but because it's so important to the large majority of the science that's done with quasi-elastic scattering, the focus is on the motion of hydrogen atoms, although there are others that work quite well, I'm going to remind you a little bit about incoherent scattering. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about neutrons and quens, uh, how to design an experiment. Uh, one of the reasons I really like quasi-elastic neutron scattering is because there's a very strong connection to simple theories like molecular dynamic simulations. They are relatively simple to do these days. There's lots of tools. I'll tell you about an elastic incoherent structure factor, which is a, uh, a method to extract geometric information about the types of diffusive motions that you're going to be looking at with quens that don't rely on sophisticated modeling, for example. Uh, instrumentation plays a huge role in the types of information, the time scales and link scales that you can sample with quens, and so I'm going to go over that role a little bit with you. Um, and then, I'm, in fact, at the end, I'm going to give you an example of measuring uh, some, the diffusion of some molecules that are tethered inside silica using more than one instrument and more than one resolution, more than one dynamic range, and explain what we can get that's similar on both um, instruments and what's different about them. And then I'll give you a list of references and a summary at the end. So incoherent and coherent scattering. Right? Incoherent scattering will happen anytime there is a random variability in the scattering lengths of the nuclei that are in your sample. Okay? And that can come about from several different ways. You can have different atoms with different scattering lengths. You can have different isotopes of the same element that have different scattering lengths. Or you can have scattering from isotopes that have non-zero nuclear spin, like a hydrogen atom that's spin half, okay? a proton basically. All right, and if, there, if you have a non-zero nuclear spin and a random or distribution of the relative orientations of the nuclear and the neutron spin, then you will also get incoherent scattering, okay? So that's the underlying phenomena that give you incoherent scattering, but here's the important part you need to know. Coherent scattering gives you information on spatial correlations. It's directional. So if you're looking at a different, different scattering angles, you'll see, for example, Bragg peaks, okay? That's coherent, that's a collective phenomena. It's a, it's a multi-atom uh, uh, correlation. And it tells you about collective motions, like uh, phonons, for example, in uh, single crystals. Incoherent scattering, on the other hand, is, uh, looks at the uh, behavior of individual nuclei or atoms, right? So it's, we call it single particle scattering, and it carries information on the inelastic side um, or quasi-elastic, like we're going to talk about, about the diffusive dynamics, diffusion coefficients, and in particular we call them self-diffusion coefficients. Uh, the elastic scattering, we're going to talk about the elastic incoherent structure factor. That tells you the geometry of the type of diffusive motion you're looking at, whether or not it's Brownian or continuous motion or jump diffusion or jump diffusion in a plane or confined in a cylinder, or simply rotational motion, or some combination of all of that. That's all reflected in the EISF. Um, you can get a Debye-Waller factor, uh, and for example, I can tell you how many hydrogen atoms are in your sample based on the, in the strength of the uh, uh, elastic incoherent term. There's some discussion, um, a good basic discussion of the relative roles of these things. There's a classic book by Marshall and Lovesy. It's out of print and has been for a while, but you might be able to find a copy somewhere in your library. Uh, this is a little bit more recent book, although it's getting a little older too, but it is more commonly available. 
Methods of X-ray Neutron Scattering and Polymer Science, and it's got a good discussion about coherent and incoherent. Okay, so that's the overall background. We're now going to take a look at what it is about hydrogen that makes it special for us. So for quasi-elastic scattering, hydrogen is our friend. And the vast majority of the papers that you'll look up, if you do a search on neutron and quasi-elastic, a lot of them will have hydrogen in them. Okay. Um, and in fact, I believe you, those of you that are going to be doing an experiment on basis this week will be looking at um, uh, um, ionic liquids, a, 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 a proton bearing ionic liquid. And that essentially falls into this category. So here's the thing about hydrogen. It's a spin half. Uh, it has a very large incoherent neutron scattering cross section. In fact, um, it's uh, about 80 barns. So 80 barns, a normal cross section might be on order a barn or less. So it's very strong scatterer. So often if you make a sample that has hydrogen in it, the incoherent scattering will dominate the signal that you get. Um, hydrogen and deuterium have opposite sign scattering links. That affects the coherent part. Uh, deuterium has a much smaller cross section and a much smaller incoherent cross section. So if I am designing a sample and I want to see the motion, say, of one part of the molecule, I'll protonate that part of the molecule and I'll deuterate the part that I'm not interested in. Okay, because deuterating suppresses the signal for a quens and uh, protonating increases it. Okay, so if I want to look at, um, say, a solvation problem where I want to look at some molecule in a solution, say a protein in a solvent, I'll deuterate the solvent and protonate the protein. Okay, so that's how you would do that experiment. All right. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, why should you care about quens? I care about quens. Okay, why should you care? Um, there's a lot of science areas that can be addressed. Biology, water solvent mediated dynamics, including proteins. Um, chemistry, ionic liquids, that's the subject of your experiment uh, on basis. Lots of water in porous media on surfaces, water at interfaces, clays, other complex fluids. Uh, proton diffusion in uh, um, ionic conductors, uh, those kind of things, proton conductors, hydrogen storage. Hydrogen is a very ubiquitous uh, element. And uh, so uh, since it's so well suited to quens, uh, quens uh, looks at a lot of science areas. We probe two diffusive motions. Another reason I like quens is that there are a large number of analytical models. Uh, much like SANS, where you can take a model, apply it to your data, and uh, do a parametric study and extract information, or um, uh, uh, provide a framework for thinking about what it is you're measuring. Close ties to theory, particularly MD. It's complementary to dielectric uh, relaxation, NMR, light spectroscopy. They all overlap in some part of the dynamics range that they're sampling. And in particular, the reason we do it, even though it's expensive, because neutron scattering in general is um, an expensive facility and things like that, is you can answer questions you can't answer any other way. Uh, just for fun, here is a um, set of the publications by year um, that use, let's see, I think the search term for this was neutrons and quasi-elastic. Okay? And then I threw away the high energy physics ones because there's a some high energy physics that calls, goes in there as well. Um, and so, you know, last year there was a little over 100 papers. It's about 100 papers a year get published um, with those simple search terms. So, <clears throat> what do we mean by quasi-elastic? Well, here's a schematic of a neutron experiment with the incident and final uh, neutron momentum. Of course, you remember the momentum transfer is just the difference between these two. And um, the thing I want you to remember and remind you again here, and I will over and over again, is that momentum is the reciprocal variable to length, okay? So that means if you're looking at small momentum, you're looking at what kind of length scales? What? Large, right. Or if you're looking at large Q, you're looking at small length scales. Uh, energy and time are reciprocal lattice vectors, and the same thing holds. Okay, so small energy transfers means large time scales, and we'll talk about that. Largely, what that means in quens is 
the relationship between the instrument resolution and energy and the longest time scale that you can, you're sensitive to on any given instrument. So when omega, the energy transfer, is zero, it's elastic scattering. When it's not zero, it's inelastic. And then we have this kind of interesting intermediate that we call quasi-elastic because we're interested in both um, uh, what the elastic intensity is and the near elastic range, region, say energy transfers less than a few millivolts. Okay? And we call that quasi-elastic. There's a bunch of approximations that happen at very small energy transfers. For example, harmonic motions look like flat backgrounds. Okay, so phonons in a material are just flat. Um, there's another set on the other end um, at uh, very large energy transfers and momentum transfers called the impulse approximation, where the scattering looks just as if it's coming from a single uh, nucleus and you forget about everything else. So it's kind of interesting, there's these two regimes. Quasi-elastic scattering, I put this up just to give you a little bit of a picture to hold in your head. You have a well-defined incident beam of uh, uh, pool balls, all traveling in the same direction, all with the same momentum, the, all the same vector. You hit a collection of randomly um, motion uh, cue balls, pool balls, with different directions of travel and different lengths of momentum, uh, different momentum vectors. And what happens is you measure these guys after they scatter from this ensemble. So they go in different directions and they have different lengths of momentum now as they've exchanged momentum with the sample and energy. And that is what you want to measure. Okay. So low Q, we're typically measuring at less than five inverse angstroms, often less than three. Um, we only sample the component of the motion that's along the Q, the difference between this vector and this vector. Okay. The maximum of the intensity that you see in a Quinn's data set is always at omega equals zero at the elastic position. Vibrations, as I told you, can be treated as a Debye-Waller factor. Harmonic motions look like fat back, flat backgrounds. All right. And so that's kind of Quinn's in a nutshell. So let's design an experiment. And let's, let's, we'll pick water here in the end, okay? Uh, that'll be the number one. So here we go. How do you design an experiment? Well, what you want to do is you need to design a sample so that you scatter, rule of thumb is, about 10% of the neutrons or less. Okay? And if you can scatter 10% and design your sample that way, that means you have very fast data acquisition, or you can look at a lot of temperatures, et cetera. Um, if uh, you make the sample too thick and you scatter too many neutrons, the probability of multiple scattering in the sample becomes too significant and you don't know what the real momentum and energy transfer is of any given neutron, okay? And so you wanna design something about a 90% transmission. So here's how you do it. You take a look at the atoms that are in your sample and that each one of them, ha each type has what we call a microscopic cross section associated with it and the units for that are barns and atoms. There's an interesting story about the origin of the uh, unit barn and Roger didn't tell it to you, did he? Well, I won't tell. If you want to hear about it, find me at coffee sometime and I'll tell you. <clears throat> the other thing you need to know is how many no atoms you put in your, in your sample. That's the number density, the number of atoms per cubic centimeter. The product of those is what we call the macroscopic cross-section. And if you have more than one type of atom in your sample, then this is just a sum over the number density for each atom times its uh, microscopic cross-section. The transmission depends very simply on the sample thickness as uh, this is the transmission uh, minus the macroscopic cross-section times the thickness and you take the exponent of that. You take the log all the way across that um, and you figure it all out. A good rule of thumb is transmission of 0 0.9 and that means for hydrogen atoms you want about 5 to 15 millimoles. Okay? If you're, at 10 to, if you're, say, at 10 or 15 millimoles of hydrogen atoms on an instrument like BASIS, uh, you're taking data in less than an hour. If you're on CNCS, neutron chopper spectrometer here at SNS, uh, you can collect data sets in minutes. Okay. Uh, right. So that's how you want to design. Here's an example, water. So we all know the number density is one gram per cubic centimeter times a mole per 18 grams. This is uh, H2O, not D2O, and times Avogadro's number, and that means that you have 
3.3, 10 to the 22 water molecules per cubic centimeter. You have, for each, the only thing we care about is the hydrogen. The oxygen cross-section is too small to worry about. You got two of those per water molecule and uh, 80 barns approximately um, cross, uh, microscopic cross-section per hydrogen atom. You multiply those two together and the macroscopic cross-section is 5.34 inverse centimeters, right? You take the formula we had on the previous page and you'll find that the ideal sample thickness in this case is 200 microns, right? So the lesson to take from this is if you're gonna study hydro hydrogenous materials with quens, the sample's typically gotta be pretty thin, okay? um, So often we make these in the form of an annulus, uh, a cylinder with uh, uh, you know, an ID that's just uh, slightly less than the OD, and you put a fluid or a liquid in there, okay? So that's the case of water. <clears throat> So what's a quen spectral look like? Uh, so I often claim that all sands, small angle neutron scattering spectral look alike. Quen spectral look alike too, okay? There's always a broad part. There's always a peaky part in the middle as a function of energy transfer, all right? The part in the middle is, the elast is often, at least, an elastic term that is a part of the scattering that does not have any energy transfer, okay? And we'll talk about that in just a minute broadened by the energy resolution, okay? And that's the elastic part. The slowest time that you can measure on a given instrument is set by the width of this resolution function, right? Because energy transfer and time are reciprocal variables, all right? On a basis, the backscattering spectrometer is about three and a half microvolts of energy resolution, full width half max. For a strong scatterer, you can see things as slow as several nanoseconds in time scale. So that's kind of how it goes, all right? You also have a broad part that we often call the quasi-elastic part. Uh, and then you have these little inelastic bumps that I don't usually care about, but some people do, okay? This quasi-elastic part has an area, right? And it has a width, okay? The width of this quasi-elastic part tells you how fast the motion is that you're measuring. And the area tells you a little bit about either how many atoms there are that are participating and giving you the signal, or, and there's a geometric contribution uh, term that comes in in a minute, and we'll talk about that. The fastest time that you're sensitive to on any given instrument is the maximum energy transfer it can go to, okay? So that's the fastest time. So the dynamic range of the instrument is set by the fastest time and the um, uh, resolution width of the instrument, okay? All right, switch topics just a little bit, and we'll talk about the relationship between quens and theory, okay? So let's talk, I think you've already seen the intermediate scattering function in Roger's lecture, at least you should have, but I'll remind you a little bit about it. It is simply um, a sum, in this case, we're looking at only the self terms, okay? It's a sum over all the atoms in the sample of the position of atom, of each atom at some time t compared to where it was at time zero. It's a very simple self-correlation function. You see this correlation function in a lot of other techniques as well, like DLS, for example, all right? Um, it's a time-dependent correlation function. We care about where it is when you start the clock and where it is now. It's incoherent because it's a sum only over uh, each atom, not correlations. And if you know anything about molecular dynamics, you know that one of the things you calculate is where each atom is as a function of time. All right? And that's what these are. These are the trajectories. So in principle, all you have to do is take your trajectories from an MD simulation and you can calculate the intermediate scattering function, okay? Um, then, if you Fourier transform this into energy space, you have what we call the dynamic structure factor. In this case, again, the single particle or incoherent form of it, okay? And so it's just a Fourier transform of this with, uh, with, uh, with time and energy. This is essentially what you measure in a neutron scattering experiment, right? 
there's a few constants like a phase space const, uh, factor of ki over kf and a cross section but when you take all of those things out this is what you're measuring as a function of scattering angle and energy transfer right so it's a pretty fairly direct step to go from your neutron experiment to this function and then form the link back up to say an md simulation so it's quite direct and it's um, it's very common to have an md simulation to help provide some of the context for analysis of quen's data there are some tools out there on the web to make this transformation um, there's one that was uh, created a while ago called nmoldine and you can find the source code for that here uh, there's a more modern version of this type of code called Cecina, which uh, gives you uh, a, plat uh, um, uh, a framework for running it on, uh, pass on um, parallel computers. So this is kind of a parallel computer version of Nmoldine. All right. This is going to be the science example we're going to talk about. So let me tell you a little bit about what you're seeing. You're looking down the pore of a um, MCM41, which is a porous silica. It's a very nice silica. You can tailor the dimensions of these pores over quite a wide range. The other nice thing is that they arrange themselves in a rather, in a, in a nice unit cell hexagonally. And so you can, you can uh, simulate them quite well. The pores are not really connected, uh, um, uh, except through, uh, I guess, the pore walls. And so these, these, these are dynamic. But things that happen in this pore are, are essentially isolated from things that are happening over here. Okay. Um, this is diphenylpropane. So there's uh, two phenyl rings and a propane linker. And if you have a very good chemist, you can tether one end to the silica substrate. And this is what we did. And we looked at diphenylpropane as a function of how many molecules you put in a given pore size and what happens when the pore size changes. So the curvature changes and there's more or less surface area uh, for the diphenylpropane molecules to interact with. So I'm gonna show you, just to give you an idea of what kind of dynamics you might be able to see, I'm gonna show you a quick movie. And it's a bit jittery, uh, but it's a dynamic matrix, so these guys are vibrating. These are the diphenylpropane molecules, and they're doing a lot of vibrational motion as well. But every now and then, they rotate on the end, or one of them flips over and gets closer to the surface. This guy will flip and rotate. They'll explore the volume of this uh, inside this pore. They do like one another, so they kind of hang out next to one another. Okay? Um, they really hate being in the middle and away from everything. Okay? That's, that's not a good place energy-wise to be. So they're, they're either clustered together or they move next to the surface if they can, all right? And that's, um, we're gonna take a look then at some of the kinds of motions and how you would analyze this motion, all right? And that's what we're gonna look at for our example. All right, so now with that example, let's talk about the elastic incoherent structure factor. This is a model independent way to get some information from a Quen's measurement. It's a geometric uh, information tool, all right? So pretend with me that you can draw a box around, and we care about hydrogen atoms. So I'm gonna draw a box or a cube around this hydrogen atom whose dimensions are two pi over Q, right? Because length and, and Q are inverse uh, reciprocal variables, all right? And I'm gonna do that at time t equals zero whenever I start my clock, right? If the hydrogen atom stays inside this box the whole time, okay, then on that link scale, it doesn't look like the hydrogen atom is moving. And all I measure is elastic scattering, okay? If the hydrogen atom moves outside of the box, okay, then it gives me a quasi-elastic broadening. If it moves out of the box on a time scale that I'm sensitive to, so if it moves out of the box in 15 minutes, I don't care because my relevant time scales are pico and nanoseconds, okay? But if it moves out of the box in pico or nanosecond time scales so that I can measure it with the resolution that I have on the instrument, okay, it gives rise to this kind of a signal, then um, it will no longer appear elastic, it'll appear quasi-elastic, right? So 
if I care about how much scattering there is in the elastic and know how much there is in the quasi-elastic, this is just an area uh, calculation. So the area of the elastic, the area of the quasi-elastic. If I take the ratio of the elastic to the total, okay, that doesn't depend on normalization because all of that's is canceled out. It only depends on being able to model how much is here versus how much is here, and you can do that in a number of different ways. Then you're going to calculate the EISF. Right? It's essentially the probability that a particle is found in the same volume of space at a subsequent time that's on order of the instrument resolution. Okay? And so it also depends on the box size. Right? So if I make a very big box or a very small queue, then it's got to move a lot farther on the time scale to get out of that box. Right? And the EISF um, tells you a lot about the geometry of the motion of the particles that you're interested in. Okay? And we'll come back to that in our example. Now, I want to also talk about quins and neutron scattering instruments. So we said at the beginning that quasi-elastic scattering typically works at Qs less than 5, and in fact, usually the momentum transfers are somewhere between 0.1 and, say, 4 inverse angstroms, because there's a few wavelengths that are often used, and there's only so much angle that you can use to get Q. All right? And the length scales that correspond to that are about 30 to 60 angstroms down to a couple of angstroms or so. And of course, this all depends on the wavelength and the angle of the measurement. The time scales are set by the width of the instrument energy resolution. For a quens capable instrument, usually that's 100 microvolts or less. Okay? But higher resolution means longer times and slower motions. Right? The total dynamic range is often less than 2 millivolts. I said certainly 5. So high resolution requirements, like here, 100 microvolts or less, emphasizes the use of long wavelength neutrons. But long lambda means you're only going to get a certain Q range, right? Because Q is determined by lambda and angle, and long lambda means small Q. So the incident neutron wavelengths are typically anywhere between 4 and 12 inverse angstroms, and in, that's what they are in millivolts, all right? So that sets the Q. So at 6 angstroms, your Q range is typically 0.1 to about 2 uh, inverse angstroms. So why do we have a variety of instruments? And I'm going to get, tell you about instruments here in a, just a minute. The instruments often vary in resolution from about a microvolt to 100 microvolts. That's a hundredfold change in the instrument resolution. All right? Um, I'll remind you that something that Lee probably told you, which is if you're doing an inelastic or quasi-elastic measurement, you have to know what the energy of the neutron is ahead and after the scattering process. Okay? That means that you have to have a certain resolution for the incident energy and a resolution for the final neutron energy. Right? That means to improve the resolution, you need to improve the resolution of both of these terms, typically in an optimized case. Right? So each improvement in the resolution often costs you linearly in neutron flux. Okay? So you have to throw away neutrons to get a tighter band, a tighter energy band, and better energy resolution. Right? If you make them approximately equal, then a factor of two gain in resolution costs at a minimum about a factor of four in flux. Okay? So this is why if you want to look at um, relatively faster motions and you can use a coarser resolution, you don't want to give up a factor of uh, 100 squared uh, in flux to get there. Okay. So you measure it on an, on, a res, on an instrument that has a broad resolution and not a narrow resolution. All right. Often, instruments with broader resolutions um, might also have a larger dynamic range, like cold neutron chopper spectrometers compared to backscattering spectrometers. All right, so here's the role of instrumentation. There's about 25 neutron scattering instruments in the world that are useful for quens. There's about six of those in the U.S., so the competition is high, okay? But the opportunity is good because in the U.S. we have some of the best quasi-elastic neutron scattering instruments and capabilities available in the world. They're available at the NIST Center for Neutron Research. Has anybody been to NCNR? Yeah, all right, nice place, great instruments, nice people, good food, 
Lots more choices than you have in Knoxville. If, you, if you're ever interested, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll give you my favorite restaurants in Washington or Gaithersburg. Well, not so much Gaithersburg, but close by. Um, and here at the SNS, we have BASIS, the backscattering spectrometer, and the cold neutron chopper spectrometer. And just for fun, I threw in the neutron spin echoes, and they measure uh, dynamics um, on these time scales and much longer, but in a different way using spin precession methods. We'll talk about that, but that's a whole nother talk. So here's the trade-offs. We talked about the trade-off between resolution and count rate. So to get a factor of two improvement in resolution, you're often down at least a factor of four in count rate. And if you haven't designed the instrument very well, you can be down a lot more than that. Um, there's a trade-off in flexibility. Disc chopper spectrometers can change the wavelength and that map through a Q omega space really flexibly. Backscattering spectrometers are kind of tied to the selection of, of analyzer crystal, what you can sweep through. Uh, the dynamic range is a very important parameter. And the neutron wavelength, of course, uh, determines what your min and max Q are going to be. And again, large, large wavelength means high energy resolution, long time scales, and slow motions. But it limits your Q range and uh, uh, limits you to looking at larger length scales. Okay, So those are your trade-offs. OK, uh, Brian, how much time have I got? No. Come on, 20, 20. We got any, you guys got any questions up till now? Pretty straightforward? Okay, because I, I do want to get to the science example. So this is the high resolution neutron energy landscape. There's uh, backscattering, and this is the Q omega, uh, this is an energy transfer Q, or reciprocal space, time, and um, length scale. And this is what the backscattering spectrometer looks like. This is what a cold neutron chopper spectrometer looks like. This happens to be the one at NIST, is in green. And this is what a spin echo looks like. So since it's a log log plot, spin echo always looks like it wins. And it does sample a large, a large uh, uh, portion of this landscape. So what kind of science? Molecules in confinement are often in this Q omega range. Polymers and proteins um, uh, extend even outside the range that you can access with neutrons kinematically. Colloids and complex fluids tend to be down in here. Some of it's in backscattering. Um, small molecule diffusion is in this central range, nicely accessible in backscattering and uh, on the, say, a cold neutron chopper spectrometer. And uh, uh, all of those techniques are available actually both at NIST and here. All right. The science. So here's my tethered molecules. If they're tethered, what does that mean? That means that over the length scale of my experiment, they can't move globally. So ultimately, there is no long-range translational diffusion in this problem. All the motion, all the diffusive motions are confined because this, they can't release this tether. Okay? We're going to look at MCM41. Um, there's a whole bunch of these things that I'm going to look at, but typically the samples are about uh, 700 mg, 7.7 grams gives you enough area to do this experiment. Oh, and I don't know, a tenth of a gram or less of uh, DPP. The temperature range is going to be 240 to 340 Kelvin. We can do simple fits and more complex ones, and there's a bunch of the various um, uh, sample configurations that we did. Uh, I want to talk about elastic scans. Another way to extract information from on a Quinn's instrument without actually doing an analysis, or at least not a very sophisticated one, is just to set the instrument up and measure how much elastic intensity you get. And forget about the Quinn's part, forget about that quasi-elastic broad part, just how much is in the middle, okay? We call those either fixed window scans or elastic scans, depending on uh, who you're talking to and which instrument scientist. And if you measure that intensity as a function of temperature, so in this case, um, this is as a function of DPP coverage in one, um, one size um, uh, MCM41. And this is what happens when you change um, uh, the pore size. Okay? This is what bare MCM41 looks like. So if there's no quasi-elastic dynamics, the only thing you're seeing is the Dubai-Waller effect. Okay? And the Dubai-Waller effect um, 
looks pretty much, as long as it stays harmonic and as long as nothing's happening, it looks pretty much like a little bit of a kind of a flat line with some slope uh, decreasing slowly as you go to higher um, uh, temperatures. Of course, if it's a pretty soft material, it'll, it'll decay faster. Okay? And then on top of that, okay, and these are not subtracted, this is just for reference, these are what happens when you add uh, uh, more and more DPP. Of course, you get more signal because there's more molecules in the beam. Right? Um, and you start down here at low temperature with a dynamics. There's no dynamics, basically. You see essentially kind of a Debye-Waller type effect, like you did here, over some temperature range. And then you see a curvature. Okay? And eventually, of course, if these things let go of the surface and started moving on large length scales, these things would decay all the way down, basically, to whatever this line is. Okay? But for now, um, the important thing is, is that somewhere in this curvature range is where you're going to be able to see a Quen signal, typically. Similar things happen in pore, on the pore size dependent side. So this is integrated over the entire detector array of the instrument. You can do a little bit more sophisticated by an analyzing the Q dependence of this intensity. All right? And what you should get, this is just a Debye-Waller uh, um, uh, factor. You, the intensity that you get at, zero, at the lowest temperature that you measure okay, is just going to fall off as an e to the minus q squared u squared over 3, as long as this part matters. And so if you apply this, uh, this uh, analysis, what you find is, is that you have um, a displacement, a mean displacement of, in this case, the hydrogen atoms and the DPP that kind of look like this. And then you have this transition range to where you're starting to see quasi-elastic scattering. And so right here is where you get the onset of diffusive and anharmonic motions. Okay? And for this uh, discussion, I just called that T sub T. Okay. All right. So here are the three pore sizes that we looked at. And these are snapshots from an MD simulation. Of large pores, and, and the, oh, sorry, the other thing about these is these samples have as many of the DPP molecules as you could crowd in there, okay? as you could tether. Right? So of course, you get more molecules in a larger pore. But you end up, the molecules actually really like to hang out near the edge. And so you end up with a lot of volume in the middle that can be sampled as they transition through. But you never find the molecules hanging out in the middle. As you get smaller, Okay, the molecules can actually fill up the middle and still interact with themselves quite a bit. Okay? And so that's a pretty favorable place for them to be. As you get to smaller, very, very small pores, 17 angstrom diameter, and it's really you can see it's not even a very good approximation to a, to a circle now. Um, the molecules are very crowded and they, they're really just constrained by how they can get packed themselves in there. There's very little room for them to actually move like you saw in, in the original movie where they might flip from over here to over here. All right. So what does that mean? Well, in terms of that T sub T, by the way, so I'll go back here, that's where I see the temperature for the onset of dynamics. All right. There was no dependence on how many molecules I put in the large pore. Okay. They all, uh, if I had a few molecules or large molecules, Anharmonic and diffusive motions all started at the same temperature. Didn't matter how crowded the serve, how crowded it was. All right, um, and I basically just said uh, what what's in here. Now let's we'll take a look at what happens a little bit more. Okay, so this is a Quen signal um, collected on the high flux backscattering spectrometer at NIST. Okay, and we're going to do the EISFs. All right, and here's what they look like. Right. So as a function of temperature for the 30 angstrom diameter uh, sample, okay, the EISF as a function of momentum transfer does this. It starts at zero, or starts at one, okay, because at momentum transfer zero, how big is the box? One over zero is infinity, right. So the EISF is always one at Q of zero, because it doesn't matter what's happening. They never get out of the box, okay? And then uh, this is a model, 
this fit to the data, okay? It gets very hard on HFBS to get data down here for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is the Q min that it can get to is about here, but the other reason is from the experiment, there's too much residual small angle scattering from the pores in the uh, MCM41. So the curvature determines um, a radius, and that's going to be on the next slide. The, right, yes. And you'll see that it has a non-zero uh, intercept out here at large momentum transfer, okay? What this means is that there are hydrogen atoms that are not moving on the time scale of this experiment, okay? And so I've defined that as a fraction that are moving, which is uh, this part, the decay from, uh, from one to whatever the value is, and then one minus that are the ones that are immobile on that time scale. All right. And we'll come back to what RM is here in a minute. Let's take a look at what the widths of the Lorentzian are. So remember, I fit this in a real simple term. I fit it with an elastic, and I fit it with a Lorentzian. All right. The widths of the Lorentzian do this. As a function now of Q squared, there's a linear region, and then there's a flattened region up here. The important thing to take home from here is that the intercept here is non-zero. Okay. That is a signature of restricted or confined diffusion. Okay. That means that the molecules or the atoms are not able to continue to move out of the box that we've defined by Q, okay. which we know because they're tethered. All right. So those are some of the things you can learn already. And of course, the slope of this is telling you something about the time scale of the motion, but we'll get to that. All right, as long as Brian's not saying anything, I'm just gonna keep talking. So we're good, five minutes, uh, yeah, yeah, woke, I woke him up. Um, let's talk about a model. So we can put pretty complicated models together. Um, this one's actually a pretty simple model, although it looks a little bit complicated, but it's pretty, pretty simple. It, what this model has, and here we're thinking about the motion of a single hydrogen atom, it's got a radius, that the hydrogen atom can bounce around in a sphere. The sphere has impermeable boundaries, okay? So this hydrogen atom can only sample what's going on, whoops, sorry, I thought I had a little squiggle, inside of this sphere. This is a model, this is the simplest model for restricted diffusion that exists, okay? So your hydrogen atom is confined in space to a spherical volume, and it moves around randomly in that volume. That's a simple model. I, our molecule is more complicated. It has a tether point down here, and it has a lot of hydrogen atom positions. But intuitively, the farther the hydrogen atom is from this tether point, the larger volume it can sample, because the molecule can have conformational changes, it can pivot around this point. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a model that's an ansatz of a lot of spheres, okay, with big spheres out here associated with that atom, hydrogen atom, and smaller spheres associated with the hydrogen atoms near the tether point. And then just to be simple, we'll say that the sphere diameter changes linearly from here to here. Okay, nice simple model, right? It's been used before, I didn't create it, I found somebody else that had used it once or twice, okay? Um, and so here's the linear model, it depends on how far away it is from the tether point, and the parameter we're going to fit is the largest diameter sphere, which is located out here at this hydrogen atom that's farthest from the tether point. And here's my model for the dynamic structure factor. I have, this is an elastic term, right? This part is my background from the MCM41, right? This part is um, how much of the hydrogen atoms are not moving Okay, that's this part. This part is how many of them are moving. Okay, so this one, if they're not moving, then it's a, then it's a delta function in energy transfer. It's just elastic scattering, all right? Here's the fraction that are moving. They have a Debye-Waller factor associated with their vibrational motion. And then this is this um, uh, motion uh, in, a, um, in a sphere 
um, that we talked about just a minute ago. The other term in there is the diffusion constant, how fast it moves inside the sphere. And what we're interested in are these two numbers and how many molecules are moving. So if I put all that into some nice computer code and I write it all up and I fit all of now my backscattering data from basis here at SNS, I can fit all the data, it's a log scale here, to that model and you can see it does a really good job of defining it over the energy transfer range from about minus 100 microvolts to 300 microvolts and over the accessible Q range. Okay. So the model works well, whether or not it captures any of the real physics or not is, is, is kind of up to you to decide, I guess, or simulation. So the first thing we care about is how extended is the motion? How big is the R, all right? So um, as a function of pore diameter, okay, this is kind of counterintuitive. As I make the pores bigger, the maximum amplitude that's sampled by the, by the diffusive motion of the tethered molecule is smaller. Okay? And I alluded to that when I showed you the pictures. What happens in the large pores is all the molecules can hang out near the surface. And so they just sample motions near the surface. And this is small. As you get to smaller pore, they can't stick near the surface. They can't get near enough to be happy in the middle, and they just keep sampling the middle volume as much as they can, all right? Um, as a function of coverage, the picture's a little bit different, all right? Um, so here's the, here's the answer, though. Small pores and high coverage tend to drive the molecules into the pore center where there's more volume available for motion, and that's the physics of what's happening in this system, the geometry. How fast is the motion? Well, this is the diffusion coefficient. Um, as you get a larger pore, there's less things for the molecules to bounce into. So when they do move, they move faster. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to tell you really quickly about two instruments, and then I'm going to quit because Brian will you know, tell me to. Here's the high flux backscattering instrument, uh, which is the backscattering instrument at NIST, and here's the one at SNS. The one at SNS has lower resolution, but a much broader dynamic range. The one at NIST has a much better resolution, but a much narrower dynamic range, okay? So this, in both of these, the gray is the Lorentzian type analysis, the Quenz part, the quasi-elastic part, and then this is the elastic part, okay? And here it is blown up so you can see it um, uh, on this scale. These samples were slightly different, but very similar. You can find the paper, um, it's about five years old now, but here it is in JFIS Chem C, all right? So what do we learn? Well, we know we can learn something about the geometry of the motion and how fast the motion is and how many molecules are moving or not moving, all right? So how does that look like uh, between the two uh, instruments? Because they're measuring very different looking signals, even though it's the same sample, all right? So the short answer is everything that depends on the geometry you get nearly the same answer on each instrument. Because this just depends on how much intensity there is in the elastic peak versus the quasi-elastic peak. And that's pretty easy to determine on both instruments, okay? And so things like the fraction of the molecules moving, this was that flat asymptotic part of the EISF. That looks pretty good for both instruments. And the geometry of the motion looks pretty good on both instruments. However, when it comes to what the absolute value of the diffusion coefficient is, that's different, okay? Not surprising when you can measure over a larger dynamic range, the diffusion coefficient looks like it's faster, it's broader, all right? So you get a different um, uh, diffusion coefficient, but interestingly enough, if you plot it as an Arrhenius curve, you get almost the same slopes, okay? And that was kind of interesting. Didn't have to happen that way. And so on both instruments, even though the absolute values of these two numbers are quite different, you get nearly the same activation energy. Okay, so those are kind of the differences that you can see when you move from one instrument to the other. I'm going to skip that example, and I'm going to give you the reference materials. Um, this book, again, unfortunately, is out of print. Um, there are a couple other ones that have been written late, uh, more recently, but none of them are as good as this one. So if you can find this one, find it in your library. Uh, I already told you about this book. Uh, 
There's a book um, specifically uh, looking at uh, motion in solids, uh, solid, uh, particularly crystalline solids. Um, so things like hopping motions, oxygen diffusion, uh, proton uh, conductors and stuff. You might want to look at Hempelman's book. This is a really old book by Tassel Springer um, from 1972, but if you can find it, it's a really intuitive book. You can read it in an afternoon and it's just not heavy in equations or anything else. It just tries to feed your intuition. Some classic papers. Um, uh, we didn't talk about Van Hove functions, but they're basically the underlying feed-in um, uh, to the intermediate scattering function. There's some nice restricted diffusion papers by a guy named Varley Sears. Uh, Vineyard um, is also related to some of the underlying theory. This paper by in Review of Modern Physics um, doesn't talk about quins much, but it does talk about a lot of the different kinds of diffusive motions you can see. Data analysis we didn't really talk about, but there's uh, a long-standing package that was produced at NIST called DAVE. Uh, it does a really good job at doing things like fitting a Lorentzian and a broad component one spectrum at a time. There's a new um, uh, emphasis um, here um, and with ISIS to uh, work on developing uh, good fitting models for quins using what's called Manta, which is, Mantid, which is a, um, a, a program for analyzing data for neutrons. Um, and there's a uh, collaboration now going on in the broader European framework for building uh, uh, GUIs and other things to go around this. So this is brand new. Sometime in the next two years or so, this will be pretty robust, I think. Summary. Quinn's measures diffusion, sub-picosecond to nanoseconds. Um, hydrogen atom is your friend and has great sensitivity. Instrument selection is a critical de uh, decision although you can often tune dynamics with temperature, and so you can move yourself around uh, and find, uh, find out where you, uh, you want to be. There's world-class instrumentation, and in fact, world-leading instrumentation in the US. MD is a natural connection, and there is analysis software out there. And so that's where I'm going to stop. So any questions? Or, yeah, OK. Sure, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if I missed it, but did you say you could measure quins with a single uh, So the question was, can you measure quins, quasi-elastic scattering, with neutron spin echo as well? In neutron spin echo, what you do is you can measure the same kind of dynamics, although NSE is usually set up for doing coherent dynamics, okay? And we talked a lot about incoherent single particle type motion, all right? Um, but NSE measures in a different way. Okay, so it, it's, there's a direct correlation between the s neutron spin precession and the difference between, uh, and from, do you know how spin echo works? Classical spin echo? Okay, so what you do is, instead of looking at an ensemble of neutrons, you use the neutron spin to encode its energy difference or momentum difference for each neutron one at a time. And that can get you a very high resolution. Okay, um, because you'll let the neutron spin precess many, many, many times before the sample in a, in a magnetic field, and then you'll do it again after the sample, but in an opposite sense. And if those same magnetic fields are present at the beginning and the end, you'll end up with the same phase of the neutron spin that at the end that you had at the beginning. If you measure a phase difference, that means the neutron spent different amounts of time in those two magnetic fields. And that was due because of its velocity. And if it's changed velocity, then it's, it's changed energy. Okay, and so that's how spin echo kind of works, all right? So you're measuring a phase difference in the neutron spin before and after the scattering experiment and after you've done all this precession. That essentially is directly related to um, uh, what we call the Fourier time or the time. So in a, in a NSE measurement, instead of measuring S of Q and omega, you're really measuring the intermediate scattering function itself. So you're measuring it in time domain and not in the energy space. But you can, you can often set up experiments in NSE to get information that you want from a quasi-elastic. But typically, NSE is measuring slower motions over larger length scales, at least as often implemented. We had one in the back. 
So the question is, if, it's, if quens is incoherent, so, so quens is not just incoherent. You can measure coherent quens as well. Okay? It's whatever the, whatever the experiment's giving you. I just talked about analyzing and what kind of information you get from incoherent. All right? But if you have an incoherent process, can you measure multiple uh, dynamic processes on different uh, length and time scales and even do that simultaneously? And the answer to that is yes, depending on how well separated those are in either queue dependence or, um, or, or time scale. So if they're very close in the same time scale, they're going to look the same. Right? If one time scale is inside the resolution width, it'll look elastic while the other one might be outside of it. Okay? Um, you might find a time domain where the faster motion moves beyond your energy window, and then it just looks pretty flat and you're seeing the other one. But sometimes you'll actually see Lorentzian shapes where you might have more than one Lorentzian, and that could be a signature, doesn't have to be, it could, but it could be a signature of two dynamic processes. Once you get beyond two, it gets really, really hard to sort everything out unless you've got a good theory model to check it against. Uh, that's a good question. Yes? Uh, the question is, does a cold neutron chopper spectrometer also do fixed window scans, or is that only a property of backscattering spectrometers, I believe is what you've asked. And the answer is, on a cold neutron chopper spectrometer, you can certainly look only at the elastic scattering. And because it's often the strongest part, you can get a good idea of what that is on a faster time scale, that, I'm sorry, on a faster data acquisition time scale then you could measure the full quens over the, over the energy transfer range. So there is an advantage to doing it, um, to doing a rapid survey on a cold chopper spectrometer, and I've done that on some of my experiments to understand where the quens signal is coming in as a function of temperature. But the reality is you're also measuring the broad part at the same time. But you can measure the skinny, tall part much faster to the sensitivity you need to be able to understand that fixed window scans. So the answer to your question is, sure. I'm going to cut the questions off here. Thank you.